All right, I want to welcome on my next guest. We've got reality TV star and former Pro Bowl tight end, Mr. Gary Barnards. Gary, how's everything going for you? Things going well. Can't complain. Awesome. I'm doing well. Doing well. It's a crazy year, but I'm making it, making the best of it. Hopefully, we're getting past this stuff, this uh, virus. And tw- I'm trying to forget this year ever happened. Correct. Yeah. Everybody's trying to do that. Oh, yeah. So I have a question. So you're, so you're on The Amazing Race, airing now. When did you guys tape it? So this was filmed in 2018, November oh, really? 2018, two years ago. Wow. And how long were you guys taping? I saw it's relatively quick because people might think it's a while. So so everybody is gone for 30 days, no matter what. No matter whether you get eliminated or not, you're out for 30 days and you're just sequestered. So you're away from everybody, no phones, no internet, no nothing. Can't talk to anybody back home. So everybody's basically off radar for 30 days. That's wild. And then, so how did you get involved with it? Did it just kind of, they introduce it to you? No, so it's actually funny. So me and D'Angelo were in South Africa visiting one of our buddies. And somehow we got in the conversation of like traveling and, like the amazing race. And I said, D, would you ever be interested in doing something like that? He said, yeah, why not? So that just in passing, that was like in January. And then come July, we had an opportunity to send the video in and possibly be on it. And D'Angelo was like, well, I only said I might would. I never said I would. I like, well, you're <laughs> locked in now. Yeah. So then we sent in our video and we got picked. And so the rest is history. That's wild that they filmed it two years ago. I figured it's it's wild. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. And then so, what what was that experience like? I'm not. I I don't want you to give anything away. I think I know. I saw it airs tonight. What was it just like as a general? How was that experience? Uh, It was a blast. It it is completely different than what people think. Uh, You don't get much sleep, and uh, it is a lot of traveling. But it's a lot of fun. I like to travel in general, and it's a way for me and D'Angelo to have our competitive edge come back out because. We both retired the same year. So for us, being able to come out and compete against other teams and try and win a million dollars is awesome. Yeah, it's awesome. It's something like you and the Bachelorette, like it's dominating the headlines. Yeah. So I want to ask you a little about your football career. So how did you end up at Louisville? So I was actually recruited uh, from Middleburg High School uh, from Louisville, and I was in Florida. And so they recruited me, and I took a couple other visits, and Louisville was just the best fix. I got to play right as a freshman, and Petrino was my coach, and he really got the best out of me. Which tight ends did you kind of model your game after? So I, I like to—I don't like to be considered just a receiving tight end or just a blocking tight end. And throughout my career, I've been known as both. Yeah. So I've been known one year I'd be, oh, he's a blocking tight end, and then the next year he'd be, oh, he's a receiving tight end. Well, that's because I wanted to be both. I didn't want to be just labeled as one. So I tried to do it as the guys that were both both of them. And one of them really is Jason Witten. Jason Witten growing up, he was always a guy who could do both. He could block at all times and he could also run routes. So I think that type of player was what I was trying to model my game after. It's awesome. And so while you were at Louisville, were you just focused on college football or was the NFL the ultimate goal? So in high school, my goal was to get professional in some sport because I played basketball and baseball oh, and cool. football. So that was always my goal. But once I got the opportunity, I was like, oh, okay, well, I'm getting recruited. I have a chance to go to college. So that was number one. And then once I got to college, I was just focusing on school and then football. And then probably my junior year, then I realized, okay, I might have an opportunity for the NFL. So then, then it obviously, then now that training goes into NFL stuff. So I think that's the biggest thing is just preparing yourself. But I didn't know at that point. I didn't know going in as, a co- as in college. Yeah, it was a hope to go to the NFL, but yeah. there was no guarantee that's going to happen. What was your draft process like? Where did they say you were going to be going? Were they scouting you the whole year? It, it was all over. I, I heard everywhere from third round to seventh round, and I got in the middle. I was drafted in the fifth round. So I, it, you just never know. That's the thing with the draft. Nobody knows really anything. The top few picks about everybody knows. Other than that, it's all a crapshoot. How did you find out you are going to the Panthers? So they called me. I had, I had a little uh, party thing. Not a little party, but like a restaurant with some of my friends and family, my coaches. And they called me and told me you were getting picked to, to come to Carolina. So that was awesome. That's so cool. true. Yeah. And then so so getting to Carolina, was there an adjustment period for you? Just kind of getting accustomed to the pro game? Oh, it's definitely an adjustment. Coming from college pro, because in college you might have games where, oh, I can take games off. Or you might not play as well and you can still win. Well, that's not how it works in the NFL. Everybody's the best of the best of the best. So that's you can't take any plays off. You can't take a day off. You can't be sick. There's none of the, none of that. So I think that's part of it. And then just the mental aspect of it, having to know everything literally on the snap of a finger. You have to know what you're doing, and things change so quick because they're always game playing each other. That's a huge thing. 
So I know, I know you were previously talking about uh, your friendship with D'Angelo. Was, so he was on the t- Panthers similar time as you, right? Yeah, so he was there before I got there. So when I got drafted there, he was already there. So then we became a friendship and we have been to WrestleMania together That's every awesome. year after that. So like it's, it's been a great relationship. That's awesome. What do you think of the Panthers so far this year with Matt Rule? So it's different. They're def- definitely doing things different. I, I don't think anybody expected big changes because obviously it's hard when you're trying to implement a new system and all that kind of stuff. But they're holding their own. They're doing well. And it'd be interesting to see what they continue to do. If they given you any calls like to back up Ian Thomas or no? No, no, no. <laughs> I, I think I've been out long enough that teams aren't going to call. Could I still do it? I could probably give you about 15, 20 plays. That's about it. Uh, I'll call Ron Rivera. I'm at DC. We'll, <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get you situated because right now we got Logan Thomas. We need a second tight end. Yeah. So, so getting adjusted, when do you find, when did you feel that you kind of found your stride in the NFL? Well, I think, I think I probably my third or fourth year, I started to figure everything out because obviously coming in, I was only special teams. I didn't get a chance to play right away. And then I got hurt and then I took a year. I had a year off basically and trained and all that kind of stuff. And then I got to play and then Greg Olson with the tight ends. I was his number two guy. And I think after that, I was like, okay, well, I need to get out of Carolina. I need to get an opportunity. So then I went to Cleveland with Chud and I had the opportunity, was trying to get my opportunity there. And it was given to Jordan Cameron. So I wasn't truly given an opportunity. So I, I always had the ability, but yeah. I didn't get that true opportunity until like my eighth year in the league. And I finally got the opportunity and I put up Pro Bowl numbers. And I yeah. think that's, a, that's just a testament to show that, hey, there's players out there that have the skill, have the ability. They just haven't got the opportunity. That's the biggest thing is the opportunity. I just wasn't given an opportunity until year eight. And that it's just unfortunate. Yeah, That's how it worked, but that's how it worked. Did you kind of like, did, were you just like ready there waiting for your opportunity or did you kind of like make it known like, hey, I'll do anything to get out there? Well, I think I, I always pride myself on special teams in Carolina. Yeah. One of the years I was a special teams player of the year on the team. So like I focused on that kind of stuff when I couldn't play on offense. So I was just going to, I was going to do something. And then I was always able to be like a number two tight end. So I was always going to be on the field doing yeah. other things. Like one of the years in Cleveland, I was the best pass blocking tight end in the NFL. Yeah. I passed blocked like 150 something times. It's more, it's like 40 times more than anybody else. But I just did what I could do at that time. And I had the ability to run routes because yeah. I was considered a receiving tight end yeah. in college. So th- it's been there. It just wasn't that opportunity. And then I finally got the opportunity and I was able to do both. And it was just huge. What's, what's your best Johnny Manziel story? I don't really have any Johnny Manziel stories. I think he gets a huge, a very bad rap. I, I, I put a lot of that blame on ownership because I feel like they forced it on him and he was not ready. I think he would have been great if he had a full year yeah. to prepare and all that stuff. Cause we, when he got put in, we were like seven and four, like we were winning and we decided to make a QB change and things flipped. So like, it, I, I think they put a lot of pressure on him and obviously there's a lot from the fans, everybody clamoring in the media. They want to see Manziel, yeah. but I just don't think he was ready. I think he would have really benefited from a year to learn in this in the NFL, learn the system, learn how it works versus being thrust into the thing. And we might be talking about a different story with John. It's just unfortunate that that happened, but I do put some of that on, on man ownership because the coaches, they didn't want to, they were forced, their hand was forced. They think they weren't said, Oh, here, make your decision. They said, no, he's going to start. So it sort of put it out of them and put a lot of pressure on Johnny. Do you think it's a similar situation in DC with Haskins? I, I, it's different because I know last year they didn't really play him. They let him no, sit yeah. this year. He couldn't need more time. That's the thing is he only played one year really at Ohio state. Yeah. And that's tough. Like that's, that's tough. It's a big transition, but again, it, and you're playing with a lot of money and you're playing with a lot, like you got to win. Cause it, as a coach, Hey, if we don't win, we're going to, we're fired. So they're going to do what they got to do to, to win. So if they don't think Hassan's is going to be the guy, then that's what they're going to do. And as you saw, they went with yeah. Alex Smith last week, yeah. which was an amazing story in itself. Oh, my God. Fantastic. And it's that, so that 2050 season, so you had three starting quarterbacks. How did you kind of keep your stride with three different guys? Uh, I actually had – it is it's just crazy because you just never know what you're going to deal with. So each week we might have an injury or something and somebody's got to step up. But all you really can do is do what you always yeah. do. Run your routes, know where they're going to be. And I think the quarterbacks started to trust me. They started to trust some of the other guys because they see, okay, here's where he's going to be. This is what it's going to be. He's going to run this every time. 
as long as they put in the spot, it was going to be the play was going to be made. And I think a lot of it was a testament to the coaches because they game plan to make sure things happen. Like me and Travis Benjamin both had a really good years. Yeah. And I think they that we complimented each other because Travis had the speed outside. I'll take the middle. And then we still mix in the run. And that that's a, a testament to the coaches there. Yeah. Did LeBron ever reach out to you saying like, hey, keep it up. I like what I'm like what I'm seeing out there. Nope. Never. Really? Reached out. LeBron never reached out to me. He's still, he's still got time. He's still got time. So, I, so that, how did you make that catch with your legs? I'm watching, I was watching the replay today. Like, was, was it just like a freak thing or what was well, your mind? A, a lot of it is luck and awareness because it was luck that it landed on my feet and didn't hit the ground. And it was awareness because I felt it hit my foot. So my only instinct was, hey, get it to my hands as quick as possible. Cause I didn't know if it hit the ground. I just know, hey, if I can get it to my hands, at least we can see what, what happens. And I knew it was a touchdown whenever uh and i knew i caught it when i saw mitchell swartz's face when he ran over to me and because his facial expressions just told me he's like you caught it you caught it you caught it so i was like oh i guess i caught it that's awesome was there any different uh in your preparation knowing like you have all this added fanfare for like really like the first time in your career was it anything different mentally for you uh not really because i don't really pay attention to all that stuff i always try to interact with the fans anyways i did a movie giveaway when i was in carolina and i continued in cleveland where i took fans to the movies every oh, cool. week so during the season, I did like a trivia question. I just, I always try to give back. So for me, it is not, it wasn't about, oh, all these people are watching. That's fine. They are going to watch anyways because it's football, but I'm, I'm, I'm a quiet, I keep to myself, I'm yeah. private, but I still like to hang out with the fans. Yeah. I interact with them, do gives away. I did like Christmas giveaways and shopping giveaways. I, I just trying to give back any way I can because I appreciate the support they gave us. So speaking of movies, I saw your big movie go. What's your favorite movie of all time? Uh, Forrest Gump. That's easy. All right. You know what the, you know what I think the best line in that movie is that people don't talk about is when when um Lieutenant Dan pulls him off the bed and he says, "Do you know what it feels like to not have any legs?" And Gump goes, "Yeah." I'm like, yeah. "That's that hits me every time." Because it's true. Yeah, it yeah, that's wild. And so, what's it been like this year? Because the theaters have been kind of open and closed. Have you been getting by, or what's it been like for you? Yeah, I, I've I've rented some movies on uh, on demand and all that kind of stuff because it's not it's not the same. It's not it's the not, same. but it's also uh, a little overpriced. Oh yeah, they're charging they me way thirty dollars for Mulan. Yeah, I mean, thirty Mulan will never be watched <laughs> by me until it's free. Yeah. because I'm not paying thirty dollars to watch that movie just because they couldn't release it. I don't need to gouge everybody else. I think that's the biggest thing. You could have made it fifteen, twenty dollars, yeah. just like all the other movies are, and then you would have the thirty dollars. You're making it bad for yourself because it, it just looks terrible. But it's Disney, so it doesn't surprise me. Yeah, like Borat, Borat knew what he was doing. He sold his stuff to Amazon, put that put that stuff on yep. Amazon Prime. We got it that we got it the Friday before the election. And then so, um, right now, in your opinion, who's the best tight end in, press, in uh, National Football League? It, it's tough because. It, it's either Kelsey or Kittle easily. I think th those two are far and ahead above anybody else. The, they're different types of guys. Kelsey, I think, is the more fluid receiver. Yeah. Kittle is the more fluid blocker. Yeah. But they both can do both. So I like both of their games. They both can pass or catch the ball and run routes and block. But I would say Kelsey's probably the better receiver and Kittle's the better blocker. So I think if you mold them together – you'd have an amazing tight end. But I think they're both the, probably the two best right now in the league. Who do you think are some of the up-and-coming guys that, like, are about to break out? Well, I do like Darren Waller. I don't – he doesn't block as much. Yeah. But I do like his game. I think he's got skills. I would say he's probably my one guy I'd be watching for the up-and-comer. I know a lot of people are high on Robert Tunyon of the Packers. But, again, I just got to see more. Yeah. And it, it helps that he has Aaron Rodgers. Oh, yeah. I think that's a big thing a lot of people forget, like – Everybody makes a big deal. Oh, these guys are great, but they have great guys throwing to them. I, I will use Gronk as an example. Gronk is a great tight end, but he also had the benefit of having Tom Brady throwing the ball. So it made him that much better of a player. It's just like Dal – I use this always always for an example. Dallas Clark was a great tight end when he had Peyton Manning. When Peyton Manning left, you didn't hear of Dallas Clark anymore. <laughs> there's a big – there's a reason for it. Like, there's – QBs can make players so much better. And that's what I think a lot of people miss on things. They just get blinded by the stats and stuff, but the QBs really help, which is huge for Kelsey with having Mahomes. Kittle, he's we're we're seeing because Jimmy Garoppolo is not really there, but no. Kittle's got that skill. He can still make the plays. Yeah. And then with Cleveland, Cleveland now, what have what have been your thoughts on Baker Mayfield through the first few years? Well, he's had up and down. He's been a roller coaster. He had a great first year, down ne the next year. And then right now, it's iffy. Like, there's no – you can't – he's not up. He's not down. He's just eh, right now. So, it's going to be interesting to see. He's just got to keep going. And But, again, 
I always caution everybody. It's a new coach, new system that plays parts in it too. New players. That's a whole different thing. You're trying to learn all this kind of stuff and you're trying to mold. It, it makes things different and people don't understand that either. So I think it, you, the time's still out for him. Obviously they will sign him to his uh, fifth year option and see how it goes. And then they'll go from there, but uh, it'll be interesting to see. He's got to keep improving more and I, I, well, time will tell. Do you like, do you like this Stefanski hire? Uh, it, it's interesting. I, I'm not against it, but I'm not for it yet because I got to see more. They've been very fortunate this year. They've had a very soft schedule. Yeah. And the teams that haven't been soft, they have not put played good games yeah. against. So I am interested to see a legit schedule when it's not super easy and with COVID. Obviously, that also helps them too because they didn't have t- – it hurts them actually because they didn't actually have time to prepare because of COVID. So they couldn't tr- put in the whole system and everything that they usually would the way it would and be prepared. So I- I'm more interested in seeing the second season than the first season. That's where my basis will come on how the second season goes versus the first because anybody with a new coach this year, it yeah. should be like a wash. Hey, it's tough to do everything they got to do because COVID, they couldn't ex- establish their systems and get everything in. So I think that's probably the biggest thing. Do you think a lot of guys, maybe a lot of teams, however, that are having a down year because they really didn't have an actual off season should kind of be given like a kind of, I don't know, like a, like a pink slip to say, all right, like give, we'll give you another shot next year. See what you do. with actual- I'm not, not if you're, if you're not a new coach, no, because okay. your system should still be in. It shouldn't matter. None of that should matter. Only new coaches, I think, because you didn't have time to really install your system. You had, you, all you really had was a abbreviated training camp. So I think if you already were there and you're established, there should be no excuse. Your players should know this stuff. The newer guys that, yeah, it's tougher on them, but it's not a whole team. That's so that's a big difference. We're, we're, did you intertwine with Rivera in Carolina? I did. I had Rivera for two years. What, what was your experience like with him as a coach? Cause everybody. Actually, was yeah. Two years, my injured year, and my year after he was an awesome guy. Loved him to death. Great coach. He really was there for me when I was hurt and he came talk to me all the time. So I really have a lot of respect for him and I'm wishing him the best with everything he's going through right now. Yeah. And I think, I think he just finished up one of his last treatments a couple of weeks ago, but he's getting there. Yeah. But he, he's been awesome. And then so I have a question. So um, fast forward past 2015 to 2016 um, to your, your last season there, did you kind of know like you were kind of ready to hang it up or was the decision kind of made for you? No, I think it was sort of made for me after the fact. Yeah. My goal before when I started, when I got into NFL, my goal was to play 10 years no matter okay. what. That was my overall goal was to play 10 years, and I didn't really want to play more because I didn't want to risk injuries, especially if I got hurt any time between that. It might have changed. But my always goal was to get to 10 years, and I got nine. And I think the biggest thing is, like, a lot of people were confused because going in – I had still a reasonable contract that was not super high paid and I still had two more years and I could have trained the new guy that just got drafted in the first round. And I think everybody was surprised they decided to go a different route and they, they used my age as an excuse, which is, was crap to me because I knew there was Greg Olson was still out there. Yeah. Still playing. Mercedes Lewis is 108. He's still playing. Come on. Mercedes Lewis. You also (laughs) had, um, um, Gosh, what's his name? The, Walker, see. Delaney Walker. Yeah, Delaney Walker yeah. was out there, yeah, and they exactly. had just signed a new deal. So, like for me, that was just a slap in my face because it's like, hey, I just did all this stuff for you. Yeah. Y'all brought a new coach in who decided to go a different route, who didn't even utilize me the year before or this year. So, like that was my biggest thing because if you look at the two years, everybody's like, oh, he had a down year. I had eighty-two targets <laughs> that year versus my hundred and thirty targets yeah. the year before. And I had like, I think I had nine targets in the red zone total the whole season versus like 20 something the year before. So like, I think that is a huge thing that people don't look at. They don't look at all the stuff. I didn't get the opportunities I got the second year. And I had eight quarterbacks. There's a big difference. I had eight different quarterbacks throwing the ball and you're, and they want to use that as a metric and put me down. That's fine. But I think that's what really turned me off is when I got released there and then I was talking to other teams and I, was t- and I was talking and they were like, oh, yeah, they kept using my age, using my age. And the guys that they had starting there hadn't had even anywhere close to the numbers I just put up the last two years. So I think it was just more of a disrespect thing I felt. And I yeah. was like, I'm not playing for less than this amount of money. Yeah. If y'all meet this, I'm playing. If y'all don't, I don't need you. And I think they didn't like that aspect because sure. now I took the power out of their hands. 
and put it in mind. And I think that was part of the reason why I never really got an opportunity that year. Cause I just wasn't, I wasn't playing the games anymore. I was over that. I had already made enough. I'm good. If y'all don't want me to play, that's fine. I don't need football. And I think that was probably the kicker they didn't like, cause I didn't need it. Has anybody reached out since then? No, nope, not really. really. So, yep. but you said you'd possibly be interested in playing at DC because we, we need somebody. So, it, again, if they pay me a certain amount, yes. All right, Ron Rivera, me. if you're listening, he's, he's you meet the price. We, we got ourselves a tight end. Um, so uh, did um, so following football, well, you should a lot of added free time in your hands. I understand you have a nonprofit. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so it's American Football Without Barriers. We go overseas, do free football camps for kids, visit schools, orphanages, hospitals, and just give back. We take 15 NFL players with us and just visit different countries and just try to do everything we can to help build the sport over there. We've been to nine countries so far. It's been amazing. How how do you get involved with that? What what kind of feature interest? So me, Breno Giacomini, who played in the NFL for nine years or 10 years. He's on the Saints, wasn't he? No, he played. Uh, he won a Super Bowl with the Seahawks. He played with the Jets, there we and go. The right. Packers. Yeah, and then uh, our college roommate Ahmed Aladala. We started the nonprofit together because Ahmed wanted to do a football camp in Egypt, and we were okay. Let's do it. And then the revolution broke out, so we postponed. And I said, well, why don't we just do a, a camp in a different country every year instead of just being a one and done? So that's where the whole American football without barriers came across. And the reason we say barriers and not borders, because a lot of people say borders, which we understand, but the reason is barriers is because we, we also have women's camps with us. We, and it doesn't matter what your religion, what your race, what your sex, anything is you're allowed to play. You can play with us. You can do these camps and you can play football. And that's why we're barriers because we're knocking down all of those barriers. Cause when we went to Turkey was the first time we did a women's camp, we had women on the field competing against the men and you're not allowed to do that. Well, we did it anyways. We said, we don't care. This is football this is what it's about. And that's where we actually, somebody actually gave us the name barrier breakers, but we were already barriers before then, but they gave us barrier breakers, which was awesome because they saw what we're trying to do. Do you see, do you foresee in the next 15 years, the NFL sort of, um comparing to the nba in terms of all the international talent honestly no the only reason why i say no is because they're only interested in markets that are big markets that can make money they're not actually interested in the talent and that that's a sad part i think they do bring guys over and they bring over like two players for the teams and they can have them on practice squad and all that kind of stuff but they're not actively out recruiting guys and talking and looking at guys and and seeing all that the talent that is out there and plus they don't go to all the other countries yeah. i think and so that's one thing we're trying to do we're trying to stay out of the bigger bigger markets now we've been to china we've been to brazil we, but they're not little markets for the nfl and i think that's the part that we want to be different we want to visit and give everybody an opportunity we're not just trying to go somewhere that's a huge market so that way it could bring in money because that's not what it's about it's about helping people and that's what our nonprofit does that's awesome i'll put a link to it in here and i just want to ask you about your podcast so how do you get involved with that yeah, so me and D'Angelo, we just said, hey, we wanted to do a podcast. Hey, we, we have stuff we want to talk about. So we made a podcast called Cinnamon and Sugar. It's on Podbean. It's also on Apple, yeah. Google Play, and Spotify. So we have guests on. We Right now we have the Amazing Rice uh, family on. They come That's on awesome. and talk each week. And it's just been fun. We just literally talk about any and everything. It's not just sports. I know a lot of people think we talk about sports, but we do occasionally. But it, honestly, the most of it's not about sports because we're more than just athletes. We're normal people yeah. who have other thoughts and things. So we just like to have fun. And we have our host, Time, who's on there is with us. So it's a lot of fun. If you want to check it out, take a look. Yeah. And I got one last question for you. Um, so in a normal year, how many people reach out to you? How many people come up to you in a year and say, I had you in fantasy in 2015? A lot. I see a lot of it, especially <laughs> with Amazing Race. I've had a lot of it. People are fans because of fantasy football, which is awesome. I'm glad I helped them out any way I could. And then the problem is the following year, people were giving me hate messages because they didn't <laughs> understand, hey, I didn't even get a ball thrown to me. How am I going to get a catch? And people were getting upset. So they didn't actually watch the game. That's the only bad thing about fantasy is a lot of people don't watch the games anymore. They only see the yeah. stats. And then they get mad at the players, but they might not see why the players didn't get it. Guy might have been open 15 times and never got the ball <laughs> thrown to him. What are you supposed to do? There's nothing you can. Did you did you do you play did you play fantasy while you're playing? I, in the- I, I not really while I was playing, but I do play now. But I don't. Oh, cool. I'm not like I don't actually watch the games, but I don't get mad at the players because hey. I've lived it, so I know how it is. I don't really care. It's more just hanging out with my friends and hey, yeah. I beat you. Yeah. And then they always like, oh, you have an advantage because you play football. <laughs> I'm like. And then it's also, oh, I beat you. You played football. You suck. So it's fun for my friends and stuff, but it's cool. 
What's the wildest message somebody sent you during that 15 season or the six or the mean message? Doesn't the guy's probably the mean message. They said they should have killed you instead of Harambe. Jesus. All man. because I had no catches in a game when I had one target the whole game. <laughs> I don't understand. They didn't see the game, which is fine. I just don't respond to it. I, my, the biggest thing for me is it's, it doesn't phase me at all. People can say whatever they want. My biggest issue is my family sees it. My little cousins might see it. That type of stuff is what bothers me is when my family gets affected by it. Yeah. It ain't gonna, you can say whatever you want to me. Hey, I don't care. I'm living my dream. You're just watching me. So <laughs> I don't really care. But it's more when it affects my family is when it becomes an issue. Yeah, absolutely. And then how can people find you on social media? Keep up with you. It's just my name. Super easy. At Gary Barnage. All right, cool, 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 man. Well, this has been a blast. I do appreciate you taking the time. It's been a lot of fun. Everybody check out the amazing race on CBS. It's, it's, it's awesome. And I've been rooting for you guys. I know you know what happened. We don't know what happened. We got to tune in to find out.